Hey guys, Pastor Matt here. Um, one of our visions at the Village Church is we want to be a place that resources liberally the Big C Church of Jesus Christ. And if by his grace we might leave a kingdom legacy with those resources, we want to be all about that. And so thanks for watching this sermon or preparing to watch this sermon. I, I'm praying that you're watching this in community, in conjunction with your ongoing discipleship at a local church. And if, by the grace of God, this becomes one of those things that continues to build up your faith, encourage your walk, fuel your love for Jesus, would you consider giving to the ministries of the Village Church? It's actually really simple. You could either do it in the app or you can go to thevillagechurch.net backslash give and do it there. I hope that the next chunk of time as you watch this sermon, you find your affections for Jesus soaring you find courage flood back into your bones, and you fall more deeply in love with Jesus than you are at this moment. God bless you. Good morning, church family. Uh, we are the Sometas. We have been uh, members of the church for nine years. Um, we currently serve as uh, Spanish home group leaders, and we're also part of TVC Español. Uh, we'll be reading the word in Spanish today. We will be reading Genesis 2, 15 through 25. Estaremos leyendo Genesis 2, del 15 al 25. Tomó pues Jehová Dios al hombre, y lo puso en el huerto de Edén, para que lo labrara y lo guardase. Y mandó Jehová Dios al hombre, diciendo, De todo árbol del huerto podrás comer, mas del árbol de la ciencia del bien y del mal no comerás, porque el día que de él comieres ciertamente morirás. Y dijo Jehová Dios, No es bueno que el hombre esté solo, y le haré ayuda idónea para él. Jehová Dios formó, pues, de la tierra toda bestia del campo y toda ave de los cielos, y las trajo a Adán para que viese cómo las había de llamar, y todo lo que Adán llamó a los animales vivientes, ese es su nombre. Y puso Adán nombre a toda bestia y ave de los cielos, y a todo ganado del campo, mas para Adán no se halló ayuda idónea para él. Entonces Jehová Dios hizo caer sueño profundo sobre Adán, y mientras éste dormía, tomó una de sus costillas y cerró la carne en su lugar. Y de la costilla que Jehová Dios tomó del hombre, hizo una mujer, y la trajo al hombre. Dios en, dijo entonces a Adán, «Esto es ahora hueso de mis huesos y carne de mi carne. Esta será llamada varona, porque del varón fue tomada». Por tanto, dejará el hombre a su padre y a su madre, y se unirá a su mujer, y serán una sola carne. Y estaban ambos desnudos, Adán y su mujer, y no se avergonzaban. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. If you don't have one, there's a hardback black one somewhere around you. We're going to be in that passage and... Uh, Genesis 1 for uh, just a bit. I, I don't know how many weddings you've been to. Uh, there can be a variety of, of different kind of components to uh, a wedding, but one of my favorites has always been uh, the unity candle. And so if you've been at a wedding with a unity candle, the way it works is during the procession, uh, the parents of the groom, uh, they'll come up and they'll, they'll light this candle. And, and this candle kind of represents like it, it's a view of finance. It's a, a way of raising kids. It's thoughts about sex. It's ideas around who cleans what, who makes what, how dinner works, how, and, and they light that candle and then they sit down and then the bride's mother usually, because dad's trying to hold himself together in the back, she, she comes up or maybe they light before the service starts. They come up and they light this and this is 
um, the, the bride, and, and it's, she, there's a whole maybe different thought here uh, about how children should be raised or how money should be spent or what sex should look like or uh, who cleans what, who makes what, how this works. And, and then at some point in the ceremony, uh, a, this passage that we just read, not in its entirety, but just like one little phrase of it will be read. Um, and then their, the, their friend who has the best voice or some song that's meant a lot to them will play uh, and, and they will make their way to these candles and the maid of honor will make sure nobody catches on fire and, and they will take these candles and the two of them will light this middle candle saying, that although there is a clear idea of how kids should be raised, how money should be spent, how life should be organized, who makes what and does what, and, and a clear how kids should be raised that may or may not be synonymous at all, they light those and say, we're bringing these things to bear on something new. And, and then it, sometimes people blow out these other candles. I, I don't think you should ever... I am distinctly me. I am not Lauren and me. I am me. So my, my candle is still very much burning. Her candle is very much still burning. She is a person with unique gifts and unique abilities and, and unique callings that, that God has placed in her. But we said in front of God and all of our family and our friends at the time, we're going to do this thing. And if you're thinking that sounds complex and difficult, you're right. Like even the Bible itself says, and this is Ephesians 5, this is our primary text for next week, that this mystery is profound, right? Like this, this idea, it, it's profound. And so here's what I want to do today. Here's, it's a six week long series. We're going to cover it all. Next week, we'll look at husbands and wives and the roles that God's given us. Uh, the weekend after that, we're just going to look at friendship. What does friendship and marriage look like? Week after that, we're going to look at marital sex. Uh, we're going to then look at how to fight well, because you will fight. It's just, will you fight well? Uh, and then we're going to round out the series by talking about legacy and what legacy means. But, but, but all that I want to put on the table today is what is this mystery? What is this thing? And the word of God will put its weight on us. I'd like to establish, let me move the Bible out of the way. Let me just throw some ideas that I think are wise as we dive into this six-week series. I would ask you by all the strength in your inner person to not try to play the role of the Holy Spirit in this series. Like I think, oh, that brother, he's already, he's ready. <laughs> I don't know if you're saying that to me or your girl, but, uh, <laughs> but here, like you will, and I'm just pleading, I'm telling you, there's 30 years of experience. You will cut out the legs of what the Spirit wants to do in your spouse by taking a role that's not yours. Did you know that the Bible says that it's better for a man to live in the desert than with a contemptuous, nagging wife? That's the book. Don't get, I don't want a single email. I just quoted Proverbs to you. All right? So God, looking at a poor, battered-to-death husband, is like, yeah, bro, I would just go die slowly in the desert. So, so don't, don't do that. Don't nag. Don't, if I say something that you think your spouse needs to hear, you, you let the Holy Spirit do that work and not you. You will cut the legs out from under what the Spirit wants to do in your spouse. So let's not do that. Second thing, if this reality is true, and we believe that it is, then if one of you thinks something's wrong, look at me, then something's wrong. So brothers, if your wife, and I, listen, I'm, this is experience coming out, right? I, I think women have a tendency to nag and chip a little bit, and men have a tendency to think their marital issues are their wife's issue. If one of you thinks that something's wrong, then something's wrong. You can't be like, well, that's your deal, baby. Go deal with it. That's not going to work. And so here's what I want to do. I want to set up because here's where you and I find ourselves. Uh, we live in a moment of history where there are two very distinct views on what marriage is and what it should accomplish. 
and they are actually in form and function completely at odds with one another. And so the only way I know to talk about them is one is the traditional historic view of marriage. And when I say traditional, please don't go, you know, that kind of trad life thing that's online right now where people like finding a homestead and making their own bread. That's not, I'm not talking about creating your own clothes. That's not a traditional view of things, right? So that's not what's in view. Traditional, when I'm using that word, I'm talking about this is the way human history's worked for a long time. And, and then I want to get more into the news. So let me start with the traditional view traditional historic view of marriage. The traditional view would see marriage as a permanent covenant union, that word's huge, designed for the sake of mutual love, procreation, and protection. It was viewed as like a solemn bond in order. Now now hear me now, because this is where, this might even sound controversial to you, right? That's how far we've slid down the line. It was designed to help each party subordinate, press down, conform our individual impulses and interests in favor of the union, in favor of the middle candle. So I've got a light here. I've got my own desires. I've got my own longings. I've got my own. And I'm saying, when I'm saying yes to Lauren, when I said yes to Lauren and lit that middle one, I said, that's not all that matters in my world anymore. And by saying yes to Lauren, I said no to a thousand other things. By saying yes to Lauren, I said no to a thousand other things. I made the decision. I spoke vows, covenantal vows that said, there are parts of me that will be subordinated for the sake of this union that we're making. And the Catholics have viewed this historically as a sacrament, that it's divine, given by God. It actually reveals something about the reality of God to all humankind, or specifically the church. Protestants would view this same covenantal sacred union as something in the category of common grace, which means that that this is what's best for human flourishing, so that um, Protestants are gonna take the role that this container of marriage, this covenant union, not contractual union, this covenant union creates the safest space for women and children and humanity to flourish. That's the traditional model. Um, To do the new, I'm just gonna quote uh, the Jedi, Tim Keller. He did all the sociological work. I don't need to read the 70 books he read to come up with this, you know, paragraph. I'll just thank him for doing that work and I'll read you from Keller, the, the new view of marriage. During the Enlightenment, things began to shift. Shift from what? This traditional view of marriage. The meaning of life came to be seen as the fruit of the freedom of the individual to choose the life that most fulfills him or her personally. Instead of finding meaning through self-denial, through giving up one's freedoms and binding oneself to the duties of marriage and family, marriage was redefined as finding emotional and sexual fulfillment and self-actualization. This new approach did not see the essence of marriage as located in either its divine sacramental symbolism or as a social bond given to benefit the broader human commonwealth. Rather, marriage was seen as a contract. You get that? You understand the difference between covenant and contract? Contract is you better give me something. Like your phone, your car, your mortgage, that's all contractual stuff, not covenantal stuff. I'm giving you money, you're giving me service. I'm giving you this, you're giving me that. It's contractual. This alone, this idea of contract alone moves it out from under its traditional understanding, which was covenant. The Hebrews called this kind of love ahava. It means love of the will. It means I've seen you're crazy and I'm not going anywhere. And all God's people said. (laughs) Rather, marriage was seen as a contract between two parties for mutual individual growth and satisfaction. In this view, married persons married for themselves, not to fulfill responsibilities to God or society. Parties should, therefore, be allowed to conduct their marriage in any way they deemed beneficial to them. No obligation to the church, 
tradition, or broad, broader community should be imposed on them. In short, the Enlightenment privatized marriage, taking it out of the public sphere and redefined its purpose as individual gratification, not any broader good, such as reflecting God's nature, producing character, or raising children. Slowly but surely, this newer understanding of the meaning of marriage has displaced the older ones in Western culture. So, so that means both men and women today, but both of us. We, we want a marriage in which we can receive emotional and sexual satisfaction from someone who will simply let us be ourselves. We want a spouse who's fun, intellectually stimulating, sexually attractive, with many common interests, who, on top of all of that, is all about us. Isn't that a dream? Oh, man, that would be amazing. This puts a crushing amount of weight on marriage and on our partners. If I could read that again, I don't have time to read that again, but if I could read that again, you would see what we're talking about is a parasitic relationship like a tick on a dog, except if two people come into marriage and they both have the new view, it's two ticks, no dog. It's just two people demanding that the other give them life. Give me life, give me life. It's not even a friggin' dog, it's just two ticks. And then this has, this rampant, like, like idealism is a surefire way to grow bitter, is a surefire way to grow bitter. And so with this kind of, crushing like weight marriage has almost completely fallen out of favor for two generations now like marriage is put off for a long time like we could get ourselves all put together before we come together well good luck with that and, and then it, it's even there there are many um, you know in gen z and and alpha that don't want to ever get married like why bother like it's the, it's the idea that all marriages are terrible and, and they you know 50 percent of them end in divorce by the way Neither of those are true by any way of measuring it, right? So you know how I feel about statistics. I'm with Mark Twain on statistics, lies, damn lies, statistics. But this is a Gallup poll, 2.5 million people across three years. So I like those kind of odds, right? 2.5 million people, married and unmarried, uh, across three years. And here's what they found. Married adults are 20% more likely to describe their life as thriving, so the questions were like, they, they were posed like a ladder with a, the bottom rung of the ladder being miserable, the middle rung going, making it and thriving up near the top of the ladder. And of that 2.5 million people, the married adults were 20% more likely to describe themselves as thriving than anyone else that was surveyed. In fact, marriage was a st stronger predicator of an individual's well-being than education, race, age, or gender. Marriage was the thing in the data that stood out as thriving. Now, the 20% well-being boost was the same among married men and women. So it wasn't like the men going, I'm thriving, and the women were like, this is awful, or the women were like, I'm thriving, and the men were like, it was awful. It was just like, they both were right there at there, and this was the most fascinating to me. 40% of those who were not happy, not thriving at the beginning, circled back around by the three-year point and go, no, we're there. And they deduced from this data that those who are in a difficult season and didn't move right to divorce actually began to hit that thriving level at a way they never imagined three years before that. Now, um, the, the, and then I'll say this, and then I want to get to the text because none of this is text. This is just sociology, which... I love a lot of sociology because oftentimes it'll catch up to the Bible. It doesn't validate the Bible. The Bible validates their findings. Yeah. And so here in this, this idea that, that all marriages are miserable and that 50% of them end in divorce is just simply not true. All the sociological data is that married people are the happiest in our culture. And, and so with that said, here's, all, here's my plan. I want to define what marriage is biblically. That's all I want to do today. And, and it's, I've got two points. Don't, don't think that that means this is shorter. There's just two points, right? And here are the two points. Marriage is a partnership and marriage is a picture. Marriage is a partnership. Marriage is a picture. Let's look back at our text. This is Genesis 2, 15 through 22. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I plan on camping out on that for a while. I will make him a helper fit for him. That word helper is the same word used for God just in a few more chapters. So just brothers, that ain't got nothing to do with making a sandwich. So I'll go ahead and take that shot across the bow right out. That ain't got nothing to do with getting laundry. That, that helper is like how God helps his people. You tracking with me? That's a pretty big statement. That's a pretty big deal right there. I'm gonna make for him someone that does the stuff I do. Then the Lord God said, it's not, uh, let me go. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds and the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of the man." Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So marriage is a partnership. You you have to answer this question. Why is it not good for Adam to be alone? We, We know it's not because sin because sin hadn't entered the cosmos. We know it's not because God, you know, it was an oversight because God doesn't forget stuff. So what is he weaving into the tapestry of creation? What is he embedded in his word for you and I to grasp and understand in light of this gift of marriage? Well, that's a great question. I I think to understand it, we've got to go back to Genesis 1. So Genesis 1 and 2, so you understand their dynamic is Genesis 1 is like way back, wide angle lens on God creating. Chapter 2 is a zoomed in picture of what God's doing in that zoom out. So we need to zoom out so we can see why it's not good for Adam to be alone. This is Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In our initial passage, chapter two, you you see not only the very first wedding in human history presided over by God himself, but you're actually seeing the first royal wedding occur. You're you're meeting the first king and queen on earth in Adam and Eve so that God, as creator, creates all the natural material. And then in chapter two, he forms Eden, his truth, beauty, goodness on display. And then he comes to this young king and queen and he looses them on the rest of creation. He's like, you guys fill the earth, subdue it exercise dominion so that the entire earth sees and knows my truth, beauty, and goodness. And if I could use my sanctified imagination here, there had to be some excitement about whether or not this created thing made in the image of God among the heavenly hosts can do this task. And so in my mind, I like this idea of like the Adam in the garden and, and there he is and God puts in front of him a horse. And the heavenly host are watching. They're just kind of gazing upon what might happen here. And he's like, well, it's strong and it's 
man, we, we might be able to ride that. It could probably help us build. If we think about kind of subduing the earth, we've got to get from one all the way to the ends of the earth. We're going to need something that's stronger than these little legs. And, he, and he's like, you know what? Calling it a horse. And I've got to believe the heavenly host like, oh my God, he can do it. He can do the stuff that we do. And there was this like, whoa. And yet, for God's good design to fill the earth with truth, beauty, and goodness, the horse wasn't going to work. Neither was the lab. Now, I love a good three-year-old lab as much as anybody, but, but that's not going to help with this. It's not good for Adam to be alone because he cannot reveal, show, fill the earth, and subdue with anything else in all of creation. So God said, I'm going to give him a helper suitable for him. And, and this is biologically suitable. Because this, this, this is why. Like Adam's like horse, oxen, camel, platypus, donkey, I don't know, duck. And, and then it's like, no, no, not like me, not like me, not like me, not like me, not like me. And then when he sees Eve, he's like, like me, whoa, I mean, like me. She's like me, finally. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, like me. So that marriage is first and foremost a partnership for the filling of the earth of the beauty and goodness of God. And, and this is a far cry from the demands that, that my wife serve me or, or, or make me feel better about myself. Or, you know, like That's a far cry. It's like I've, I've entered in to this partnership with Lauren and, and our goal is how do we make much of the beauty, goodness, and truth of God in our union together? Like, how do we do that? With, with all the baggage, I'm coming in and I got like a freight train. All, all the baggage that she came in with, she got a couple U-Hauls, <laughs> right? And we're trying to do this together and all the complexities. I put struggle in the subtitle for real. Right? Like this, it ain't always going to be sweet. It ain't always going to be pretty. There, there's, there's sanctification involved. There's, and, and, but it's, I, I've always had it in view. Not always. I needed to grow into this view of marriage. And I know God put us together for truth, beauty, and goodness to be displayed in how we do life together, how we raise our kids, how we spend our money, how we spend our time, how we use our talents. We're going to give those over to the Lord and know that that's what this marriage is about. Not my sexual gratification, although that's nice. Not my, I mean, you just keep going. Not my self-esteem, so but no one can destroy me or encourage me like she can. I mean, you could send me a mean email, and if you're crazy about it, I'll giggle and show it to a couple of people. Look at this guy. Lauren can crush me. She's like really one of the few people on earth that has that kind of power in my life. Like, But our partnership, our covenant partnership is together as best we can by the grace of God, we're going to make much of King Jesus. Now, this is not to say that singles, divorced, or widowed are somehow out of this plan. That, that is so far from truth, and I've got so much great biblical evidence, and I'll just give you one for time's sake. Jesus was single and was lacking nothing. And I think you could make a pretty profound argument that no one has done more than Jesus. You also have, just forget, that you also have the Apostle Paul going, it's actually better to be single. You're not divided of heart. So you're not, if you're widowed or divorced or single, you're not outside of this, you're right in the middle of it. This is just woven into the fabric of creation because equally true is Proverbs 18 that says, he who finds a wife, finds what's good. He who finds, so these are not at odds with one another. They, they're there that the Lord will use the single, the divorced, the widow, and he, he uses marriage. In fact, marriage is to be wanted and pursued and desired unless he gives you the gift. And if you have the gift, you know you have the gift. Now, it is not just, it is not just a partnership it's also a picture. Here's how I would say it. In fact, I've said this at every wedding I've ever done. If you watch kids when they're little, for the most part, there's always exceptions, right? This is a big generalization. For the most part, little boys want to run around with little boys. Little girls want to run around with little girls. 
right? There's not a lot of cross-contamination. Sometimes there is, but you know, they kind of gross each other out for a little bit. And then there is what I like to call the day of epiphany. <laughs> and the day of epiphany can hit at any point, usually around puberty where it's like, it's gross, it's gross, it's gross. Whoa, okay, I want one. And, and then the Bible's saying to us, what we see in this text and many others, is that the triune God of the universe, out of an overflow of his own delight and perfection, paints on the canvas of creation a picture of his love, pursuit, joy, and desire for us in putting it into the heart of man to pursue the woman. That he puts in through testosterone and all sorts of other biological mechanism, he puts into the heart of the man, I want one of those. And he puts into the heart of a woman, I want to be pursued by one of those. And the book is saying, oh, this is a picture. This is a picture of Christ and his church. This is a picture of God's covenantal faithfulness to his people. This is the way John Piper said this. The divine reality hidden in the metaphor of marriage is that God ordained a permanent union between his son and the church. Human marriage is the earthly image of the divine plan. There is not a more consistently used image in the Bible for God's covenant commitment to his people than the image or metaphor of marriage. And it, it starts in just, it's a line that works all the way through. And so in Exodus 19, in Exodus 19, God has delivered his people from the bondage of Egypt, and now he's going to begin to form them as a people. He's going to give them the law. He's going to put his tangible, visible presence right in the middle of them. And in Exodus 19, you've got this kind of, it's an odd like marriage ceremony between God and Israel. There's this exchanging of vows in Exodus 19 where God says, here's my promise to you. And the people of God goes, here's my promise to you. To you, And then throughout scriptures, when the people of God are being spiritual adulterers, all the prophets refer back to this moment as a marriage covenant or contract or covenant. Yeah, I got the word right. So let me give you just two of these. This is Jeremiah 2.2. 2. Go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. That is a direct reference to Exodus 19, and then they're wandering in the desert for 40 years. He said, I, I remember your bride-like honeymoon love when you followed me into the hard places where you trusted me to provide, where you followed me with great zeal. I remember. Will you remember that? And then again in Ezekiel, which Ezekiel is such a trippy book. i got to preach through that thing. Uh, we're not ready yet. We'll, we'll get there. Ezekiel 16, 8. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love. And I spread the corner of my garment over you and covered your nakedness. I made my vow to you and entered into a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. Do you hear it? That's covenant marriage. You became mine. I saw you. I covered you. I moved towards you. And just like this is the thread of the metaphor, when the people of God turn their back on God and choose to chase after other gods or make themselves king, it is on repeat called adultery. In fact, I had a bunch of passages, then I just said, let's not do it because a lot of them call it whoredom which I didn't want to say because there were kids in the room, but I guess that backfired. I mean, I guess I ended up saying it anywhere. But this, it's all over Deuteronomy. It's all over Hosea in a very unique way. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, even when you move into the New Testament, this is still how God sees our turning our back and betraying him, choosing other gods, being our own God, saying no thank you to his reign and rule in our lives. He, this is James 4.4. 4. You are adulterous people, not idolatrous people, you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Do you see it? Like you adulterers, what's adultery? I choose the world over you. 
I, I will break covenant with you and, and I'm going with the world. And the Bible always talks about this in very graphic ways. Here in James 4, 4, it's you adulterous people. Throughout the prophets, there you hoard after, you guilty of whoredom. You, I mean, it's wild back there. But this is the idea that God has entered into a covenant relationship with us and marriage is a picture of this. And, and I, I think one of the things that's hard, like even as I was studying and getting ready for this whole series, the image that's difficult, it's, it's really, and so I'm just gonna give you the, the image, the, the image that we see in God's covenant faithfulness and our persistent spiritual adultery is that God continues to welcome us home like in a way that if it was happening in the physical, everybody would think was insane. Everybody would think was insane. I love this one from 2 Timothy. So this is 2 Timothy 2, 3, where we are faithless, he's what? Faithful, where, where we continue to cheat, where we continue to take, this biblical language, other lovers. He continues to move towards and love, forgive, welcome home and renew the covenant. In fact, the whole story of the Bible ends in what's called the wedding supper of the lamb. Let me read that. We're just about done. I think you should be proud of me. This is Revelation 19, six through nine. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. Why? For the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, please listen to this. Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. I, I love this. Blessed, because I think more important than understanding partnership is understanding this picture. I said it last week. Let me double down. Some of you don't have a marriage problem. You got a Jesus problem. And here's what I mean. Without an understanding, let me, without an understanding, that Jesus' love, grace, zeal, desire, and, and identity that he grants me, if that's not given to me, I'm gonna try to find that in Lauren, and I will destroy her. She is amazing and has no capacity to heal little broken Matt, little nine-year-old, throw a fit, start a fight, burn something to the ground, Matt. She got no, I can't even control little Matt. What is she gonna do? I'm telling you, I brought this into my marriage fix me. She had no capacity. I have to receive and understand this invitation from God through Christ. Come, have a seat at the banqueting table. Come, my covenant commitment and love for you gives you identity, healing, and wholeness in a way that no spouse has any shot ever to give you. Come, there's a chair for you at the banqueting table. Eat and drink and dance and rejoice in my love for you so that you don't have to try to grab it from somebody else. This frees me to do all that God's gonna show us next week to be the husband he'd want me to be. Like I've got to receive from him an identity that's separate than, from Lauren. To own that I am a child of God. I'm beloved by the king of the universe. That hole he has filled, so I'm not demanding that she gets in it. I'm telling you, some of your marriage would be just a lot better when you finally surrender to Jesus. Stop absolutely crushing your spouse. It's not that we don't have the hard work of sanctification together. It's that I don't want to ask Lauren to be God to me. She's going to stink at it. And I don't want her to expect me to be God to her because I'm worse Right? This is to understand the picture and to enter into the invitation, which you, according to the passage, you are blessed today because I'm letting you know that you got a seat at the wedding supper of the Lamb. Yeah, right now, you, you've got a seat. Like there's an empty seat right there. 
at the wedding supper, when all things have been made new, when the glory of God covers the earth like the waters cover the sea, they're gonna be this epic celebration and you just got a ticket. But you have to say yes to the ticket. The Lord doesn't snatch anybody up and throw them into the wedding supper of the Lamb. He just invites. Come, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Come, drink new wine. Come, feast. Come, rejoice. Come, dance. Come, receive from me what you can only receive from me. And then from that posture, we can tackle the difficult stuff that comes in trying to work this middle handle. But without that, I just don't think you've got a real shot. And, and here's why. For is Because what, what people can do is you can be like, hey, that new one sounds a lot more romantic than the old one. Maybe. Except it doesn't work and it's not. <laughs> like in the first passage we read, you remember the last sentence? And they were naked and unashamed. That, that doesn't have anything to do with nudity, it has everything to do with intimacy, connection. Your soul is starving for intimate connection. You were designed for it. God is triune in his nature. We've been made in his image. We were, we were imaged by God for deep connection. And, and I don't know that you can get there if you haven't experienced the forgiveness of God. I'm not sure you can get there if you haven't tasted his grace. How, how could you possibly extend grace to anyone if you feel like no one's ever extended it to you? There, there is a freedom and a delight being offered in the picture. Don't mistake the, the picture for the partnership. The invitation to be children of God to enter into this covenant with the creator of the universe is what marriage is imaging. It's the metaphor, it's the picture of it. And, and so I'm, I'm praying through this whole thing that the work God does in our lives is actually under the surface of our marriages, that he gets this stuff into us what it means to be loved and forgiven and set free and called his own, what it's like to have somebody who knows everything about us still delight in us, right? Because that's a lot of marital beef too. Like our spouse can bother us because they know all our weaknesses. We don't like that. I don't know about you, I hate being human. I don't like it. Every time I get sick, every time somebody, I just hate being human. And, and praise God, I've, I've got... I've got the creator of the universe who sees all of that in me and all the evidence of scripture history in my own life is he just keeps moving towards me. He just keeps moving towards me. So two things, here's how I want us to end today. One, if you've never said yes, you know, you've got the, the God of the universe that's like, hey, covenant union with me. I see you, I know you. I love you. I'd love to commit all my power, knowledge, wisdom, and godness to you. What do you say? Do you want to enter into a covenant relationship with me? I, he, when we end today, there'll be some prayer team members up here, and I would love for you to just come up if that's you and just be like, I'm saying yes to that. I, I want in on that. If he's got the ring out, I'm throw it on my finger. And then I want you also to pray this way. I'm going to pray. I'm just give us space here in a minute, just literally a minute or two. Now, I wonder if maybe while I was preaching today, it, it didn't bubble up by the power of the Spirit into that prefrontal cortex that you're putting a lot of crazy expectations on your spouse. And I told you not to be the Holy Spirit, but one of the things you can do is after you get in that car today, turn and go, hey, I, feel, I just want to ask for your forgiveness. I, I feel like I have just, I have tried to get you to be God to me. And then I've gotten angry and resentful that you can be, you can't be. And so will you please forgive me for that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna head on this journey with the Lord right now, but I just wanna ask forgiveness. I mean, what, what a great way to start this, right? To just go, I know you can't give me what I'm asking you to give me. Please forgive me for the ways that I've either manipulated or, or said cruel things, or please forgive me. I, I, I can see now what I've been doing. I, I don't wanna do that anymore. I'm sure we're gonna have some bumps along the road, but let me just start. I'm sorry, will you please forgive me? I don't think you're gonna be met with, 
Oh, you make me, I don't think. If you, if you do, God, I'm sorry, email us. <laughs> and, and so here, there might be, I know the complexities of this. And, and so maybe even the stuff I'm describing, there are situations in your specific marriage that make this, like you don't even know what to do. So let me throw out, uh, on Wednesday nights, really starting this week and on for the rest of our time here, we, we have um, open marriage groups where we're committed to kind of walk with you and learn those nuances and dive into those things to walk with you. This fall, we're kicking off uh, classes called re-engage classes. And in those re-engage classes, you're gonna have the opportunity to kind of deconstruct and reconstruct understanding and practices in marriage. And, and then honestly, if you're just like, I have no idea what to do, you can email us at care at thevillagechurch.net and we'll just dive in with you. We're committed by the grace of God as best we can for marriages to heal and thrive here. Uh, but that will require you taking steps towards, right? Okay, let me give you some space just to pray. Have you said yes to this covenantal relationship with God in Christ? Have you put a crushing weight on your spouse? Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in here. Pray a blessing over them. You, you know all our backstories. You know the hurt we've come in with, the complexities of our relationships, the hurts that are either present or past or fears for future. Will you continue to meet us in those with your grace? Thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the picture. Thank you for a partner in gospel ministry. We, we thank you for purpose that transcends our own pleasure. We ask that you would encourage us and build us up in your love. It's for your beautiful name I pray, amen.